up to give away your land. It would be giving away your mother. It would be selling your mother. So we don't do that. So there was no understanding of giving these away. They weren't sessions. The treaty envisioned a means for us to participate in an economy that we knew was changing very rapidly. Fur trade was happening in the west, the buffalo were disappearing, fish stocks were being reduced, and we knew we needed a way to survive for seven generations. They also include non-molestation clauses, or in other words, we will live by our law, and the settlers will live by their law. That's what we understood. We were the owners of our land extending rights to the settlers. Those are treaty rights. The Crown thinks they gave us rights to hunt and fish, but we were giving rights to the settler. You will live by your law, you will uh, have access to our land, you'll have access to our resources, and we are going to treat with you so we can live in peace. Uh, our, our treaties also included guarantees of things like education, which led to the horrific experience of Indian residential schools, not unlike your stolen generations. So how are those treaties working out for us? Well, just by a quick uh, note, treaty number one in the Winnipeg area, uh, there's been a series of court cases in the last five years, seven court cases, over one little piece of land in the city of Winnipeg, because since 1871, when treaty one was signed, the Crown has never actually fulfilled the first promises of that treaty. They were to get 160 acres, or I think they got more in that one, uh, but the Crown never actually set that aside for Treaty One Nations. And they're still in court, and they still continue to win in court. And they've won in tribunals, and the government has said, yes, this is important to us, we want to settle. So if you want a little bit more information about what's happening specifically in Winnipeg <coughs> about Treaty One, look up what's happening with the Kapiong cases, Kapiong, so that's in the green there. Uh, concerns of Pequus, concerns of Sandy Bay, some of the different nations have been going to court. Treaty number 11, which was the last of the numbered treaties, was actually considered to be fraudulent. Uh, they're not sure who signed it, they're not sure who negotiated it, so it was in essence set aside and entered into a comprehensive claim, which, which looks more like um, a modern treaty as we go on. Meanwhile, back on the farm, when our treaties were being signed, when we were negotiating in good faith, the Canadian government came up with a little piece of legislation called the Indian Act. So that's why I use that term Indian. We call ourselves Aboriginal or Indigenous, sometimes Native, but Indian is the correct legal term because of the Indian Act. The Indian Act uh, came into force in 1876, it actually brought together legislation that predated Confederation, things like the Gradual uh, Civilization Act, the Enfranchisement Act. So ways that we get that Indian out of you and assimilate. That's what that law was about. And the Indian Act continues to rule over every aspect of an Indian's life. I don't live on a reserve, so it has less impact on my life, but it still has legal force. So what did it do? It set up a foreign form of government that said, that fellow is going to be the chief, and you fellows are going to be the council. Women will have no role here. In fact, women are easily removed from being Indian. All they had to do was marry a white fellow, and they were no longer Indian. And their children were no longer Indian, and that's still in force today. It brought, it brought to us, so that's the membership, it brought to us legal, cultural, and political control over our lives. It dispossessed us of our land. It introduced a pass and permit system, which was uh, removed in 1951, but that's pretty recent history. Essentially, we had to ask for permission to go off the reserve and hunt, so if we wanted our families to survive. We needed to be on pretty good terms with the Indian agent. The whole <coughs> idea of the Indian Act, and it continues to be this way, it was about our protection, I think from ourselves is how they saw it. It was about our civilization, which introduced Indian residential schools, um, and assimilation about that enfranchisement. I'll give you a quick example. A man who went off to fight in the war, in World War II, when he returned home to Canada, he was no longer an Indian. 
because he's civilized. If you got a university degree, you're no longer an Indian because you're educated. And Indians aren't those things. So that's the, that's the Indian Act. Uh, so meanwhile, we have these grand treaties, but what really rules our lives is this piece of legislation. All right, so on to the modern treaties very quickly. Uh, here's a few examples. The James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement in 1975, in my opinion, has been a disaster. There was years and years and years of litigation, compensation for flooding, all having to do with hydro development. We have the Nisga Agreement, which is in BC, so that's far west in Canada uh, in 2000, and that brought a measure of self-determination, self-government for the Nisga people. I think many people would say it's working well so far. We also have Nunavut, which I would consider a modern land treaty, comes out of a land claims uh, agreement. The Inuit, remember, are not Indians, but they are indigenous or Aboriginal people. Nunavut set up uh, not a province and not a territory, but something in between. Uh, the idea was to allow them to make their own decisions and preserve culture, language, way of life. And, that, and so that's, it's, it's interesting, but you have to remember that these modern treaties, these modern agreements are contracts that are as thick as a book. Not like my Treaty 5 that was scrolled out on a piece of paper and had X's on it from the chiefs, right? So these modern comprehensive claims are sophisticated documents that are negotiated over tens of years. And out of, out of the Nunavut Agreement, we have this, the territory of Nunavut. So treaty implementation. Our Constitution Act in 1967, when Canada became its own nation, set out the division of powers as one of the federal powers is section 9124. So the federal government alone is responsible for Indians and land reserved for Indians, which means they can make the Indian Act, which means they can unilaterally change our treaties, which they didn't really recognize in the first place. Um, and they're, they're the only ones that are held responsible for our uh, welfare. That's their fiduciary duty. Um, the provinces don't hold that duty. In 1982, Canada patriated its constitution under the former uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, not his son, but uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau patriated our constitution. There was a, a huge political movement at that time to include Aboriginal people, Indigenous people, in that constitution. Up to this point, and arguably afterwards, Quebec and Ontario, French and English, are seen as the founding nations. We were invisible, not unlike here. We were invisible. So in 1982, there was a strong push to include Indigenous people in our constitution, and we had uh, Section 25, which is our non-derogation, non-abrogation clause. So you can't add anything or take anything away from our treaties. That hasn't been used a lot in litigation, but it's been Section 35 that's been really the big, the big tool for us. So Section 35 says this, the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights, so you remember that not everybody's under a treaty and not everybody's an Indian, okay? So existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are hereby recognized and affirmed. In 1982, I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone who actually knew what that meant. It, nobody really knew. What kind of rights? What do you mean existing rights? How do we prove the rights? Do we have to prove the rights? What is a right? What does it mean to be Aboriginal? All those questions have begun to be flashed out in the last 30 some years. So section 35, some of the jurisprudence, some of the case law that's since come out uh, has looked at, of course, native title. Our Calder case from BC that thought about the notion of native title came over and informed Model, and Model came back and informed uh, Delgamook and other cases in Canadian law. Recently, the Silcotin, some people say Chilcotin case, in 2014 went to the Supreme Court of Canada and this is a huge decision for uh, 
indigenous people for the notion of Aboriginal title because it said this, and it's the first time in Canadian history, in Canadian legal history, where a specific group of Aboriginal people, an identifiable group, now have an identifiable claim over a specific piece of land. So if a mining company wants to come in, they ask the Silkoti Nation. If somebody wants to use their water, they ask the Silkoti Nation. It's not about, well, you know, it's a nice idea, but don't get too hung up on it. No, they, they are now the legal caretakers of that land. Huge case. Um, we have various fishing rights. You'll see R.V. Marshall. Um, it's the only time that I know of in Canadian history where our Supreme Court, and that's our highest court, our Supreme Court issued two decisions on the same case. I don't mean two levels of decision, I mean two decisions. So Marshall is a, 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 a sad fellow, uh, he's now passed, was wrongly accused of uh, murder, went to jail for 18 years, was later exonerated, and went off to live out his days happily fishing. He went out and caught, I believe it was $714 of eels, and was immediately charged under fishing regulations because he didn't use the right nets. As an Aboriginal man, uh, exercising his Mi'kmaq fishing rights. So he went off to uh, court again, and this went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, yes, you have an existing Aboriginal right. He actually argued a treaty right, but the court chose to recognize an Aboriginal right. Yes, you have an Aboriginal right to fish. Oh, but by the way, don't get carried away. And I, of course, I'm paraphrasing. They said that you have, as an Aboriginal person, the right to a moderate living. And this is my interest in taxation because there's a stream of thought through the cases having to do with taxation and making a living. And what can an Aboriginal person actually accomplish economically? And the court, you talk about judicial violence, they are dead set against rich Indians. They do not care how, how you get there, but they're going to resist it no matter what, and I can show you that in the case law, and that's, that's the essence of my thesis. But Marshall was said, uh, said to set the precedent that there is a fishing right on the East Coast where lobsters are, okay? And so the Aboriginal people went out and were happily fishing, and the non-Aboriginal fishers of lobster went irate, and we have the burnt church crisis. Uh, they said, what do you mean? These people, are gonna, these people are going to go and fish everything out. They're going to take everything, and they're going to destroy the fisheries. I think that was some, about somebody else, actually. But this is what the white fellows were concerned about, that these Aboriginal people are going to destroy it all. And there were literally riots. And so the Supreme Court issued a second decision on the same case and said, well, that's not exactly what we meant. We meant that you can have some rights. And so they're always reeling in. We win a battle and the court reels it back in. So it's very interesting. Um, I've traveled all over this country and, and been astounded by the beauty of your land and the diversity here, but it chokes me up to see Rio Tinto's name uh, all over this country and, and to see the way uh, up in Kimberley how the land is, is raped. Um, it's, it's very disheartening. We had a duty to consult the case. So this comes out of our Section 35 um, uh, constitutional law. We had a case where Rio Tinto had flooded out a uh, valley, displaced a whole nation, and were selling off their hydroelectricity. That lease came due. They got a new lease for 99 more years, and the people that lived in that area said, just a minute. We have a constitution that says you recognize our existing Aboriginal rights, non-treaty area. And the court said, and I'll paraphrase again, it said, look, they took advantage of you for 99 years. They're going to do it for another 99 years. Nothing's changed, so there's no duty to consult. So constitutional entrenchment isn't necessarily going to help anybody. So that's the Rio Tinto LCAT case from 2010. So when we look at the treaty rights, so those are Aboriginal rights, treaty rights are of course dependent on the treaties. 
But when we take these claims to court, remember that the court defines the terms of the treaties, right? They, our treaties include things like health care, education, hunting and fishing, and taxation exemptions. But the Crown always gets last word. They have the authority to define those rights. They have the authority to define my status. They have the authority to say, what was intended with those treaties? Right? Like the Marshall case of, I think the treaty meant that you were going to have a moderate living at best. This is what the court comes up with. First Nations peoples say that the spirit and intent of our treaties has never been abided by, never acknowledged by the Crown. They understand these as session treaties, that that land is meant to be exploited and our people are meant to be displaced or dispossessed. We disagree. Uh, there are books and books of specific claims reports where groups have come forward and said, that's not how we remember the negotiations. Our elders have passed down stories about this detail and that detail, and surprisingly, many of these claims have been successful, but every single group has to, has to go to that negotiation, has to make that claim. It's not, oh, we made a mistake. Yes, you all should be enjoying your treaty rights. It's not, you will, we, we agree, you forced us to agree that this is your right in this group. And, and over here, you have that little right. That's, that's yours. That's the way the court will give up uh, the treaty rights. I can tell you that the Canadian people in general remain largely unaware of our treaties. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission having to do with residential schools, I think, has really helped bring, bring that knowledge to the forefront. And, it's, and that's helpful. So, last slide. How do we reset this relationship? Because that's really what we're talking about. Our treaties, when my ancestors signed up my treaty, they never envisioned us living in poverty. They never envisioned our children being taken away. They never envisioned us being unemployed, uneducated, being victims of violence, uh, being, being, uh, living, living out in majority populations in incarceration. They never envisioned that, right? Here's the problem though. This is, and Mitchell, this happens to be a tax case. So Minister of National Revenue uh, said this, and, and you'll find the same phrase in many of our Canadian cases. Aboriginal interests were soon to survive the assertion of sovereignty, we see that model, unless they're incompatible with the Crown's assertion of sovereignty, voluntarily surrendered or extinguished by the government. So in other words, we agree, by our own law, you have rights, unless we don't like it. We agree you have light rights unless it's inconvenient for us. We agree you have rights unless we can make money off of it and off of you. That's how our Canadian courts interpret our treaties. So our TRC, Truth and Reconciliation Report, that just came out uh, last year, says this. In 1996, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, and this is a six-volume report, comprehensive report, well worth looking up, it's all online now, can be accessed on the internet. Uh, RCAP urged Canadians to begin a national process of reconciliation, fundamentally changing the very foundations of Canada's relationship with Aboriginal peoples. This is where I believe Australia needs to start, and it's not my place to say, and I recognize that, but as a treaty person from Canada, it has to fundamentally change the relationship or it's not a treaty. Thank you. Um, this is what she goes. On that one Mitchell's, um, if you look very closely at it, have a look very closely at it because that's native title yes. and that's the yes. Inuits. Yeah? Yes. And this is how they're wiping our, all our rights away through those Inuits under those native title determinations. And that's why state governments now are pushing really fast to do and agree to uh, consent determinations to get everybody to sign everything away. And that's, what they, that's how they're doing it. So they're using the Canadian model and the Canadian experience. So we have to be very, very careful on where we go on native title. Just a question on, uh, on the treaty as well. Um, you mentioned that we just have one question and then we go on the next one. the treaty week. process, you said that um, um, in the, in the treaty is 
the right for the uh, American government to extinguish sovereignty. Is that actually a, a, a component of the treaty? And, and if it is, does that mean then that the American government can seize your sovereign rights out of your country? Okay, so Canadian government, Canadian Crown, yep, well, we don't like being called American. <laughs> can, they, can they extinguish? Yes and no. Legally, no, because they, we now have constitutionally protected treaty rights. Um, again, from the Crown's perspective, we have what are called take-up clauses. So specific to land, they say, yes, we're going to set aside this amount of land for you, if they gave it, ever gave it in the first place, gave it. Mm -hmm. um, but we reserve the right to take up land if we need it for a railroad, mining, forestry, uh, settlement, and you see the list goes on and on. So can they take away that land title? Yes, where, there, where there's an existing treaty, a case to look at, is called Grassy Narrows, the Grassy Narrows case from uh, 2014 or 2015. So in fact, it came three weeks after the Soko Teen case. So in BC, where there was no treaty, huge win. In Ontario, where there is a treaty, huge loss, because the treaty is actually used against us. 